I took a look around my shop and I realized that the capacitor start induction motor is by far the most widely used in power tools, at least at the DIY level. I mean, my air compressor, my shop vac, my drill press, my table saw, they all have capacitor start induction motors and they all have the same weakness, the capacitor. This guy clamped in my workbench is in fact a capacitor start induction motor that I took out of a washing machine here in the US. If you live in another country, your washing machine may have a universal motor in it. So there are some, some differences there. First, I'm gonna power this guy up with the capacitor uh, disconnected. In general, when the capacitor has failed, the motor will hum like you just heard, but it won't spin and it especially won't spin under load. But if I start it and give the motor a little push, let's see what happens. All right, so if your motor will only start by push starting, then you are having a problem with your capacitor and you resolve that by simply replacing the capacitor. So in this case, I disconnected it ahead of time, but if we go ahead and connect this working capacitor, the motor should start properly. So again, most power tools have a capacitor in order to help the motor get started. And I'll put some pictures on the screen for you so that you can see where you can find these items. They're almost always connected directly to the motor. Now, of course, this is sort of, this is something I took out of a washing machine. And in appliances, the capacitor may be stored anywhere in the machine. Sometimes it's put way up in the top and then it's just a wire run down to the motor. In terms of what kind of capacitor, you want to use a capacitor designed for AC. So capacitors that have a little stripe on the side. In fact, I'll show you one. All right, I grabbed a few capacitors just to show you the difference. So this one is a capacitor designed to work with AC current, but this one is called a run capacitor. It usually has a metal can like this and it's filled with oil so that it can handle the heat of being constantly connected to the circuit. This is not usually the capacitor that you're replacing, although some capacitor start induction motors will have two capacitors. They'll have a star capacitor and a run capacitor. And if you're having problems with your motor starting, I will go ahead and replace both. I wouldn't fool around with just getting one, especially considering the cost is worth it to go ahead and replace both of them at the same time. This one is also a star capacitor, just like this. I just brought this one out to show you that sometimes they come in different shapes. And this one is a polarized capacitor and you see the little stripe on the side, which tells you which side is negative. You do not want to hook this up to AC current or electric it'll explode and we don't want that. You could just search the web for something like motor star capacitor or I've even typed washing machine capacitor and I got good results from that. Uh, they come in different sizes. In general, the actual capacitance doesn't matter a whole lot, so don't obsess too much over that. What's really important is that the voltage is high enough. So for example, you can use a capacitor designed for 240 volts on a 120 motor but you can't go the other way around. You can't use a capacitor designed for 120 on a motor using 240 volts. The voltages will be too high and it'll damage, it'll destroy the capacitor. This is by far the most common problem with the motor. And in fact, before I check that, I would check everything ahead of that in the circuit. So you need to check your circuit breaker. You should be checking the outlet that you're using. You might wanna plug it into a different outlet on a different wall, just to make sure they aren't wired together and check any switches in the path because all of those items are actually more likely to fail before the motor itself fails. But once you've checked all the upstream stuff, I will look at the capacitor as the first thing that might be wrong. Second thing we need to look at is motor brushes. So I'm gonna pull my DC motor over and let's get this guy out of the way. Next up is the permanent magnet DC motor. As you can see, I've cut away a section here out of this motor so that you can see the inside. I took this motor out of a treadmill, but any universal motor or uh, brush DC motor like this will have this a similar setup. So let me bring you in a little closer so that you can see what it's supposed to look like and then we'll talk about the problems. 
Most motors like this have access holes through the bottom that allow you to see into the inside. And of course, we've got a big, nice wide opening so that you can look directly at the brush. Now, if you want to remove these brushes, you just unscrew this little cap. And these guys come out like this. And if you search for motor brush, then you can find something like this. They're really easy. This is just made out of carbon. It's electrically conductive. And this is how the motor gets the electricity to the rotor here. So let me fire this up so that you can see what it's supposed to look like. So this guy operates up to 90 volts. And so as you can see, if you look right along here, just kill that power, uh, there was maybe just a tiny little glow in the corners where the, you know, contacts are switching to the next contact, but there's very little sparking here. Generally, if you're having problems with your brushes, the motor will start to run a little hot. You'll see sparks through these little openings in the bottom. And uh, if you look really closely, sometimes when it gets really short, you get big electrical sparks there and that lets you know it's time to replace the brushes. As you just saw a minute ago, they're super easy to replace. You just unscrew it, pull it out, push the new one back in and screw it back down. Now, the next problem could be found on any motor type, and that is issues with the bearings. Now, this guy, I've already removed the screw so that I could easily pull this little section out. But I also wanted to show you on this other motor that often if you need to get to the bearings, you would just unscrew what's called the end bells. And there'll always be, you know, four or six fasteners here on the end. You'll unscrew those and then this end cap will pop off. The same thing on this side so that you could access the bearings on each side. All right, let's pull this guy off. All right, now again, this end bell would normally be a complete circle, but you get a better look at the motor brushes there and where the two wires come in and touch. And now you can also see the bearing on the end of the shaft. So we can take the whole shaft out. And those are the permanent magnets grabbing the motor there, or the rotor. So you can see your north and your south pole. And there's the other end bell. And that's pretty much it. Here are your two bearings. Generally, the bearing number will be on the outside if the person who put it together did a good job. And you probably, you can't see it on the camera, so I'll read it to you, it's 6203Z. So that's the bearing number, and you will use that to find an exact replacement, because these guys come in standard sizes. Same for that one. In order to get those off, you're gonna need a bearing puller. Here we have a bearing puller. And the basic idea is that these jaws will grab the inside of the bearing. This little point goes on the end of the shaft. And almost all shafts have that little recess in the tip. So the point goes in there. And you would take a wrench and screw that guy down until it pulled the bearing off because that fit is very tight. Now, uh, there are more details that I'm leaving out in regards to how to get the bearings off and stuff like that. And that's because I've already made a whole video dedicated to this. So I'll put a link in the description if your problem is replacing the bearings. Now, when your bearing begins to fail, generally you have two symptoms. One, the motor gets noisy and it hears it's kind of whining and making this or rattling sound. The second symptom will be issues with torque. It doesn't seem to be as strong as it used to be. So almost anything can stop the motor up. And that can often be because the bearing is failing. So when the bearing itself is under load, it can't spin like it's supposed to spin. Uh, again, I've got a video that shows you how to replace the bearings and I'll put a link in the description. 
Okay, I've got another permanent magnet DC motor and you see it's got some blue wires sticking out of the side. These wires are for thermal protection. Now, not all motors have the thermal protection wired externally like this. Uh, some of them are just wired inside. So if you're having a problem where the motor is getting really hot and then it shuts off, then that's your thermal overload shutting off the motor. The only thing you can do to resolve that is wait for it to cool off. You can put fans on it, whatever you need to do. But there's a tiny strip of metal in there that's expanding and shutting off the circuit and it's got to cool off to the right temperature in order for the motor to turn back on. You do need to investigate why the motor is overheating though. Very likely it's because the load is too high or the temperature, uh, the ambient temperature is too high. Almost all motors have a temperature rating. This one doesn't have one. All right. This guy, ambient temperature 40C. So if you're in an environment where the temperature is above 40 degrees C, uh, the motor may begin to overheat. And this one also has thermal protection. It even says there, thermally protected. So this motor will shut off if the thermal protection is triggered. And the only thing you can do is wait and resolve the issue that's causing the motor to overheat. One last thing I want to show you on this motor, which I have cut open to make it easier to see the inside. And that's this little trigger here in the back. So here is a centrifugal switch. And what I'm about to show you is not what I would consider to be a DIY level fix, but hey, uh, it's pretty neat. So I wanted to show it to you. What I'm pushing on is the trigger for the start winding. So whenever the motor is disconnected like it is now, these springs keep that circuit closed. So that guy makes contact with the start winding and that allows the motor to get moving. Now, if that sounds foreign to you, I have a video on single phase induction motors and how they start. And I explain why you need a start winding and all that in that video. But what I wanted to show you here is just this cool mechanism where when the motor starts spinning, centrifugal force pushing uh, pushes those weights out to the side and that disconnects the switch. It's really neat. This is the kind of stuff that makes me want to cut motors open and take a look at the inside, see what the engineers came up with. But anyway, it's a cool mechanism for uh, allowing the motor to start connected to the start winding and then disconnect it. And that allows them to use thinner wire for the start winding. So this, I've got some loose wires here. If you compare the start winding motors, uh, wires, to the run windings, you can see that's almost double the thickness. This makes the motor a lot cheaper because you don't have to wind both the run winding and the start winding with heavy gauge wire when the start winding is only connected for not even a full second. So anyway, I hope you found that interesting. Well, I would love to know if you guys have any interesting motor problems that I didn't cover here because for the most part, Motors don't fail very often. It's usually something in the circuit before the motor. But if you've had an interesting motor failure and you figured out how to fix it, I would love to know, uh, short of like rewinding the motor. We're not talking about those kind of high-end fixes. But I am curious if you've had any obscure, strange fixes that were easy to repair. Leave that in the comments and I might even add something to the description about it if I find some that are really interesting and helpful. This wraps up a three-part series, so if you haven't seen the other videos, you can click on the link that pops up here. And also, if you want to see more content like this, hit the subscribe button if I earned it, and then you'll be notified whenever the next video comes out. Thanks for watching.